Welcome back into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you. Something has D.Y. really happy to start the show. I think it's probably just reliving Avery Johnson and the Pop-Tarts Bowl again. Yeah, you, you know, the the touchdown run that was a part of that opening, uh, opening I guess, is what what gets me to chuckle is I, I think Patrick Mahomes is someone else that does this. The, the, the pump fake when you're 10 yards past the line of scrimmage and a defender still goes for it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's always a good one. Well, you, you know, just as much as sometimes we think uh, those quarterbacks don't remember where the line of scrimmage is, it's pro I mean, it's probably pretty easy for a linebacker or a DB to get confused on where the line of scrimmage is because really, I mean, some of those guys, they never have to worry where it is. They always have actual bodies in front of them, so it's just like, yeah, and then you start running around and you don't know, so you have to be ready for it, although – the safe bet would probably be to just focus in on the guy that has the legs that can kill you. Uh, but hey, it, it works out. It, it does seem to work more often than it should. And I'm sure it is a maddening thing for coaches or fans of the opposing team to see and go, why are you biting for that? He cannot throw the football 15 yards past the line of scrimmage. But uh, if it's going to work, you know, keep it in the repertoire, I would say. Yeah. Hey, Matt Wells might like it. Yeah, Matt Wells, uh, he might like it which he is the, the main man, the main reason we're here right now because what K-State we know has an open spot on the staff that they are trying to fill after Colin Klein left K-State for Texas A&M. Connor Riley stepped up, I think did a pretty admirable job as the interim OC for the Pop-Tarts Bowl. All kind of responses there after the game seemed to indicate that everybody involved thought Connor Riley did a pretty good job. There were no issues there. But it does seem like there's going to be a veteran play caller and really a guy with more than just play calling experience. Like he ran programs for parts of nine seasons at Utah State and Texas Tech. But it does seem like there's some growing momentum that Matt Wells will be the uh, the next addition to the K State staff, and he'll do it in you know probably a little bit of a hybrid role. Obviously, K State needs a quarterbacks coach as well, uh, and I know that you and, and others have pointed out like Matt Wells has has been able to coach his share of pretty solid quarterbacks and not just, you know, the, the last two years as an analyst at OU with Dylan Gabriel, but on his own volition. Like, he's the guy that had Jordan Love at Utah State and did a majority of that development there. Um, uh, Chuck Keaton was a quarterback when he took over that job that was really good. So he's been around good quarterback play. And obviously, you know, Texas Tech, you can say what you will about how things went while he was there and really they're coaching the last 10 years, but they've always seemed to at least have quarterbacks that were solid and just sometimes they didn't make it to the end of the season or even, you know, the halfway point of the season with injury. So uh, what would this mean if Matt Wells were to be added and, and what is the, the speculation on what roles he might fill? Because obviously the thought would be Connor Riley did enough to get the off offensive coordinator job after the pop tarts bowl. Yeah. I, I think they're going to be co-offensive coordinators, so it'll be interesting to see who does the play calling. Um, I, I, don't, I doubt we'll probably get any certainty or, you know, what that's going to look like for quite a while. Just that the only thing we'll probably learn is that Matt Wells will be the next hire. You know, to be honest, you can really justify the, I guess, questionable results that are on his resume. Like, he got fired from Texas Tech. Should he have? Like, uh, he took over a colossal mess that he inherited from Cliff Kingsbury. Um, so that first year was kind of the rebuild. The second year, you know, you basically were drawing names out of a hat in terms of who was going to have success during COVID. Uh, Kansas State didn't have success. Texas Tech didn't have success. Um, Iowa State did. So let's let's put that year into perspective. And then the third year, I mean – his record two days before he got fired was five and two. So <laughs> I I mean, so I, I think the Texas Tech stuff, you gotta you gotta you gotta be careful how you qualify that just because they were looking for any reason to fire him because they were they were that I guess convinced that he was a bad fit for the job and they wanted a Texan really bad. In terms of Utah State, I know some of those offensive numbers kind of fluctuate from the thirties to the top 10 a few in the 90s you got to take it in perspective he was had just terrible quarterback luck there for a little bit 
He turned Chucky Keaton into a quarterback that had 27 touchdowns and nine interceptions. Um, and then the following year, Chucky Keaton began the season with 18 touchdowns and two interceptions. Then he tears his ACL. Matt Wells slows the pace down, relies on his really good defense to win 10 games. So the offensive numbers a little bit are a product of pace there and losing your starting quarterback. Chucky Keaton gets hurt again the next year and the year after that. So you couldn't keep Chucky Keaton healthy just because of the knee problems. Then he brings in Jordan Love. Jordan Love throws for, I believe, 32 touchdowns and six interceptions in his lone year with Matt Wells. The following year, Matt Wells goes to Lubbock. Jordan Love goes for 20 touchdowns and 17 interceptions. He regresses a lot after Matt Wells. So if you really want to dive head first into some of the numbers and why they are what they are, you actually come out probably in more favor of the Matt Wells higher than yeah. you were. Yeah, the, the Jordan Love numbers are astonishing to look at the difference between 2018 and 2019 with and without Matt Wells. I mean, it is, I mean, the yardage is there in a similar format, but he attempted 60 more passes in 2019. And like you said, 12 less touchdowns, 11 more interceptions. Uh, his, his passer rating dropped from 158.3 to 129.1. So uh, look, he's the real deal. And also like you, you, another thing you can look at, he coached an all first team, big 12 wide receiver and Eric Azucama when he was at Texas Tech as well, which is another nice thing to have to where, look, this is not some like, oh my gosh, look, this hire blows people away. But I think given, number one, the speculation that a lot of people thought Matt Wells was going to get added to the staff after the 2021 season, the fact that you're going to be able to come back to him now and possibly add him when he is not like the main piece to this puzzle. Like K-State, obviously now, what, are we getting ready to go into year six with Chris Kleiman? Uh, season number six or even seven, like this thing's humming along. They have this thing figured out in a, in a way to where you're just adding ancillary pieces, and he's a really good add on to what you already have built. So I think that this is a uh, this is a this is a nice move for K State, and obviously there's some juice with Matt Wells, and we know that he and Chris Kleiman have a really tight relationship. So uh, if it does come to fruition, like you know all the the suggestions have right now. This seems like a really good thing for K-State. And, yeah, you'll have some other stuff to figure out down the line, like who who's calling the actual grunt of the plays and who has the say. But really, I mean, we've talked about this already uh, and, and stuff down the line that people will probably hear and see. But if you think about it, like you're not bringing Matt Wells in to totally overhaul your offense. I think if you're K-State, you look around and you say, look, we got a quarterback that obviously we love right now. We have a system that, for the most part, the last two seasons we've really loved offensively. We don't need to do a whole lot to that. And that's why Connor Riley does make sense and can work with this offense. But if you can bring in another voice that has a different background and a different look at it, where obviously, like, Matt Wells has been talented in his career with the quarterback situation, and you can pair that with an offensive line coach who we saw at times in the bowl game, uh, is going to default to the run and be a little bit more run heavy. I think that's a pretty good offensive brain group you've got there with Matt Wells and Connor Riley to kind of pool their talents together and see how it goes when they're actually coaching games. So, uh, you know, by all accounts, like this seems like a really good move for K State to kind of fill out the 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 coaching staff after Colin Klein's departure. Yeah, and obviously Texas Tech wasn't a fit and. I think Kansas State will be a fit, especially with this relationship and cohesion with, with Chris Kleiman. And so, and I've said this before, and this goes for players and coaches, you tend to perform better when you're in a place that just feels better, yeah. um, fits better, and is more comfortable. And, and you kind of got into it there, alluded to it. It has a chance to be a really good combination because Connor Riley, for all intents and purposes, really smart wise um, and respected when it comes to how to construct a running game uh, from a schematic and uh, strategic standpoint, whether it's game plan again from week to week, because he did a lot of that with Colin Klein or just composing it and coming up with the different concepts and, and run block schemes and all of that. Now you're pairing it 
Now, we probably don't know enough here, but seemingly you're pairing it with a guy that's been very much involved with the passing game at just about every stop. So you think you're covering both bases there. So you would like to think that this combination has a chance to be lethal when you have a really good passing offense guy and a really good rushing offense guy. And I think we talked about the Jordan Love stuff. You look at that one full season of Chucky Keaton, and then that first part of that next season when he had 18 touchdowns and two interceptions, I think he was about to turn Chucky Keaton into a monster too. Yeah, this is – I mean, it, there's there are some stuff there to really like about, about Matt Wells. There's also stuff that, like, you can point out the flaws and everything, but kind of to, to what you've pointed out, like, there are a lot of reasons and, you know, they're not necessarily excuses, but you can explain why things did not go the way – that you would have liked. Number one, that's you look at year one at Texas Tech. I mean, yeah, you're taking over the the mess and disaster left behind by Cliff Kingsbury and Alan Bowman, who as much fun as we had at his expense, his entire career at Texas Tech, his third string career at Michigan, and even this year at Oklahoma State, they didn't have Alan Bowman for all but three games, and then he got hurt when he was at Tech his first year. And so every year he's playing with a backup quarterback. I mean, think about both times K-State saw them with, you know, a different quarterback. And yeah. they Which wanted him gone. Like, they went, he went into that K-State game basically knowing if he didn't win, he's getting fired. And even if he does, the next time he loses, he's getting fired. Yeah, and they, they were did afraid, that to him. They, they were afraid how many games. They were afraid he was and they won seven games. games that season. Like, they won <laughs> seven games yeah. in 2020. And he was 5-2 and two before, right before he got fired. They were they wanted to fire him at any point that they were able to do because they were afraid how many games he was going to win. That's yep. what it was, to be quite yep. honest. And you kind of got into it there with the quarterback injury stuff, bad luck. What's interesting about that is like, okay, did he just run the shit out of the quarterbacks? He didn't, so that's the strange thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, you you look at his guys and what happened, like, I mean, Tech is going to always think, well, man, maybe if Tyler Shuck never got hurt. He he threw for 400 yards uh, in the third game of their 2021 season and then got hurt before they played Texas, and they had to go with Henry Columbia most of the way and then eventually Donovan Smith. Like, just a lot there to, to how things played out. So, unfortunate bad luck for, for Matt Wells at Texas Tech. Bad situation because, to what you said, like, it feels like they kind of – made a hire they didn't like at the time. Then COVID, everybody that it was just not a fair year to assess people, so it made it look even worse. And so by year three, they're like, eh, let's you know pull the ripcord on this thing. And I think now, like, they I'm wanted. not trying to advocate for him to be a head coach again anytime soon, but, like, I'm trying to make it clear to people that this is by no means like a meltdown situation that, oh, Matt Wells is coming. Like, this, I think, should be applauded as a really good thing. Yeah, I mean – he is two years removed from being a head coach at the FBS level for nine straight years. Now as your office coordinator. I mean, that's yeah. typically not necessarily a wheelhouse that you're living in if you're Kansas State. Now, there's there's reasons to be hesitant and there's reasons to be optimistic, but moreover than not, I I think you have a I, I can't complain about this hire, I guess. I, I, yeah. I'm struggling to find the words here, but like, especially with quarterback development, it seems like every, you know, both Utah State on a couple of different occasions, and then he was tracking to do the same at Texas Tech to really grow quarterbacks. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on now. Quick uh, little little shift in tone. The transfer portal, the, the number one thing going on right now, the portal entry window has closed for – anybody that would be leaving K-State. So you don't have to worry about anybody departing K-State at this time now uh, because they're, the window's closed now. I guess if you know you know the Cats were going to yank anybody that was in the playoff, they could do that. So or, or, or grad transfers and still. Yeah. Have. So we have all that going on, but K-State active in the portal in terms of what they're looking for in a couple of defined spots. We know that they've, they've already brought in a handful of guys in the secondary. Obviously, an offensive lineman was a, an ed addition. Now we know that probably the biggest emphasis is a transfer wide receiver. Number one, what should K-State be looking for with a transfer wide out? And number two, 
how is the possibility of Matt Wells coming on to K-State staff impactful to their hunt for a transfer wide receiver? Yeah, I, I think the two most dire needs in the transfer portal still are wide receiver and nose tackle. They're really hitting it. The ground running at the wide receiver. They have, they've been hosting a guy since Wednesday and Jabre Barber transferred from Troy, almost had a thousand yards. Um, going up against the likes of Florida State, Texas A&M, and South Carolina, though, so it won't be easy. Uh, Matt Wells, you got a guy that at least has head coach cachet, passing game cachet, so it's going to help. And then he's got his past, right, at Texas Tech, maybe even at Oklahoma, where maybe he can draw back to some of those relationships with guys that might be in the portal. Now, you got to think Texas Tech's got a couple guys in the portal, um, one might even be committed, two of them are committed that, you know, Matt Wells recruited or coached. So I think Kansas State's, you know, trying to get in back into those um, recruitments, into those living rooms as well and see what they can do. Um, you know, Matthew Middleton as a guy that he coached at Kent State. That was at Penn State last year. And Dante Cephas that's now in the transfer portal as well. Um, Pittsburgh will probably be a, a tough competitor there, but, that's another one where there's a you know an inherent connection. Um, same with Malik Benson, you know, leaving Alabama from Lansing, Kansas. Kansas State recruited him uh, on two different occasions, so they're going to try to get back into these races and use those things as leverage. Um, but they're certainly very, very active on the wide receiver front at this point. Um, I, I think they'll take two in, in terms of what they're looking for. Guys that could come in and make a mark right away because they want Avery Johnson to be happy and they want to surround Avery Johnson with as much talent as possible so that he can have as much success as possible these next two seasons. Maybe it's three, but you should probably only bank on two. Heck, with the transfer portal, maybe you shouldn't even bank on two, but obviously he has two seasons before he can go pro. Yeah, that's uh, it's an important thing to, to point out there. So we'll see. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of – intriguing options out there for K-State at receiver. It's just, I mean, how how accessible and, and how realistic is it to think that maybe some of the the bigger name targets on there? Because obviously, like, I think the tech guys probably seem, other than the fact that, you know, a handful of them are already committed other places uh, in the portal, but that didn't stop K-State from getting Quest Glover in basketball, or Will McNair, for that matter. Uh, what, what are the chances, though, of these guys that – Maybe I'm wrong for viewing it this way, but I view guys like uh, Cephas and Benson as being more high-profile and guys that would would get me more excited. I, I think more highly of what they could bring upside-wise. Like, so where are the chances there? How realistic would it be that K-State can be a legitimate player and possibly the landing spot for those guys? I, I mean, it's not impossible, but obviously it's tough because Cephas was going to commit to Pittsburgh last year uh, before Penn State got involved. Pittsburgh is his hometown. Most think that's where he'll end up. So you're someone just needs to tell him that Pitt sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so you're fighting against that. Now, hopefully, you got to hope, you know, maybe this relationship, prior connection to Matthew Middleton is enough to overcome that. But man, he he's back in the portal now, right? He might regret mm -hmm. not going to Pitt last year. Um, I don't know if anyone regrets not going to Pitt, but if it does, yeah. maybe it's this guy. And then with Malik Benson. You got to remember the Cody Cook connection, right? He, he, he played for Cody Cook at Hutch. Cody Cook's at Tennessee right now. Does he go to Tennessee? Uh, does he follow his wide receiver coach to Texas A&M? Colin Klein and A&M just grab Holman Wiggins from Alabama, the receiver coach. So not impossible because of you already know these guys. It's easy to have those conversations to create those dialogue and to see where you are and take that swing. But obviously I just laid out a scenario why – it's far from a slam dunk, and it's far and it's very, very. It, it could be very, very difficult. Like if Tennessee and Texas A&M want Malik Benson, I don't know if Kansas State can do that. Yeah. Now, all right. Uh, let me let me ask you one more thing in terms of what K State might be looking to add portal wise. Like we we've talked about receiver, we've talked about some other spots. Like what what is the next thing down the, the wish list where? I don't know that K-State has any overwhelming needs out there right now, but if you could get somebody here, where where would it be? Yeah, D-tackle, I guess. But as Drew kind of doomly and gloomly put it, uh, 
he's like, I don't really see any names that uh, are the most exciting out there yet. <laughs> I don't. I haven't even seen any names. That's what's concerning. Yeah. So, but they need. I think they need a D tackle now. Maybe they're shifting approach or or scheme a little bit, and then you just say, okay, we got Damian Alalio, Asher Tomaszewski, Usa Sayamalo. And then two guys that can be versatile and do both, and that's Javon Banks and Malcolm Alcorn Crowder. Heck, we got five. Maybe maybe they're doing it that way. I don't know. But if they're not, they definitely need one. Um, and obviously they chased the Juco kid, Tonga Lolo Heya, that picked Baylor. So you would think that they wanted one. They also appears to be one in linebacker. They hosted Syracuse transfer Stephon Thompson for a visit as well. He'll be at Nebraska tomorrow. So uh, compete with the Huskers for that one, at least the Huskers. Maybe there's more. I think you should be done at safety after taking the Juco – or Juco. Yeah, you did take a Juco, and you also added the Ball State transfer, Jordan Riley. But could you benefit from adding a corner? Probably. You also have to gauge temperature in that room. Like if guys are a little paranoid and giddy there, you don't – I go back to the Ole Miss example here, right? Like I, ever, I know everyone wants to go to the portal and take this guy and take that guy and this guy and that guy and load up with all this depth. But if you're not careful, then you lose someone of your own, right? That's the mm-hmm. thing. Because Ole Miss just like was just taken up, taken and taken, right? We're, we're the portal kings. We're taken. We're taken. Oh, we forgot to t- take care of our own guy. Now Quinchon Judkins is in the portal. So yeah. you got you to gotta be careful. It's a healthy balance there. So corner is probably towing that line a little bit. We'll see if they do anything there. They might not. I think you're done at the end. Offensive line. Sounds like they might want one more. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's that's good to know uh, for the uh, for the Wildcats and what's going on with uh, everything going on there. All right. Uh, let's let's shift our focus here to basketball now. That we can we can do all this and then go fully fledged out. Uh, for, for a full show here instead of b- breaking them up uh, as we do this in real time. Cause look, you never know when the news is going to actually become official. And uh, the news that we were kind of dancing around becomes official while we're doing this. So uh, K state has, you know, 20 some minutes ago, we didn't know when it would happen. They have now made it official that Matt Wells is on the coaching staff. Connor Riley has the full offensive coordinator tag, but it's a co OC tag for uh, Matt Wells, which if you think about what's funny, if you've been following along on the message boards, people were asking about, oh, well, AM just brought in this receivers coach that he has the co-OC tag. A lot of times that's done to keep somebody happy or to give them a little bit of a boost or added cachet. Uh, I think in the AM situation, we probably know what that's about. Uh, and I think in this situation, we probably know what it's about. But I will say this about the the co OC tag on Matt Wells. Like it's probably a good call, and there is probably some legitimate merit to it, given the fact that Connor Riley has never called plays before to this extent. And that I, I think that there can be some good input. And I, neither Connor Riley or Matt Wells comes across as like egomaniacs to me to where uh, they're not going to be able to handle sharing some duties and bouncing ideas back and forth. So, that's uh that's some good news there, I I guess. Uh any other additional thoughts that you need to get out there that we haven't yet on the uh the Matt Wells, Connor Riley breakdown. One thing, uh one observation from the release, associate head coach as well. Mm, mm, so Sean Snyder 2.0, Matt Wells. But wasn't that Van Malone or is he assistant head coach or uh well yeah yeah I think you might ha- we might have associates and assistant head coaches now so case to- look if you have three head coaches do you have one that's the question everybody's asking throughout America uh, right now yeah I don't know I'd have to go look real quick to see what the uh, Van Malone title was but you're right he did have uh, some kind of head now. coach I'm gonna there, look now I'm- now I bet he yeah he's the assistant head coach. Now we have an associate. Now you might have had to do that to get Matt Wells. Matt Wells, is like, look, I've been head coach for nine years at two FBS programs. Yeah, I mean, I need that. And look, let's be honest here. Now, who knows how long Matt Wells stays at Kansas State? But yeah, <laughs> Avery Johnson's his ticket back to being a head coach again. Yeah, it's true. It's very true. So we'll see how it plays out. What uh. The look goes down. Uh, real quick, I jumped the gun in the you know hecticness of 
Matt Wells and everything. Uh, one last thing on the portal, and this is about a departed Wildcat. Uh, let's get let's get a vibe check on Will Howard and uh, the likelihood that he now goes to Ohio State after uh, Miller Moss looked like the next Lincoln Riley Heisman quarterback, and then Ohio State said, "Man, you want to make USC even less attractive to Will Howard? Uh, our offense is going to look like dog crap, and we desperately could use you after their three points they put up in the Cotton Bowl." Uh, what is the the thought and the reaction to Will Howard likely being the next Buckeye great quarterback? Yeah, it's he's he's he, he's being dealt. He's getting fed to the wolves a little bit. I, it's, it's a tough. It's a, it's a tough spot. Yeah, because the Big Ten's getting tougher. Let's be honest. There's no divisions now. I don't know mm-hmm. what Ohio State schedule looks like next year. If they have play Oregon, if they play Washington, USC. Like and and you already had maybe Michigan, Penn State. <laughs> I don't. You're gonna play a tougher schedule. Maybe I'd have to look at it. Uh, notable games next year at Oregon, at Penn State, and Michigan. Doesn't seem like there's really anything overwhelming on there, though. So uh, yeah, nothing crazy for nothing for crazy. next season. But I mean that's a roster that's kind of in upheaval right now. You have a lot of guys that have opted out and went, went to the transfer portal. You're not going to have Marvin Harris Jr. You're not going to have Julian Fleming. Uh, that offensive line is going to be totally different, I believe. Uh, you'll have a good defense. I mean, as always, Jim Knowles is there, so I don't. I and you have the number one wide receiver in the country that you just signed too, and Jeremiah Smith from IMG Academy. Yeah. But it'll be an interesting thing. What I will say is I love Will Howard. Uh, great kid. Very, very kind. And had a lot of good moments. Some not so good, but a lot of good moments. But, like, the outside noise sometimes got to him, and we really were introduced to that to this year when he's talking about everything he's been through, hearing these people say this, hearing these people say that. I mean, Ben Sinnott went on a blast just to defend him, right? Because they thought that there was some unfair criticism. Well, Ohio State's like that times 100. Like Kyle yeah. McCord, most people thought just had a solid year, and they ran him out of town. Yeah. Well, and you got to think about it too. Like, it's not just local people you're you're doing this with at Ohio State. It's it's a national thing. Like Ohio State's a national brand. And I look, it, Will Howard going to Ohio State will make them a lot tougher for me to hate on because uh I, look I don't hate him because of you I just I'm not a I'm not a Ryan Day guy I well I, I don't I've know if I'm a Ryan well. Day guy so <laughs> so uh but I'll definitely like I, I definitely would love to see Will succeed there it's just that is a tough spot and you talk about with take- all these guys moving on and and then yeah that like it's it's local times a thousand and then the national thing on top of that is such a big deal where everybody's going to be criticizing you and like yeah, it's it's going to be hey, a tricky deal. Stay, stay off Twitter, Will Howard, because yeah, if you thought it was bad, look what Kyle McCord got after going eleven and one. Yeah, yeah, stay off Twitter and, and probably Letterman Row as well uh, are on three side over there. So okay, all right, let's uh, let's move on here. Let's focus on basketball a little bit. K State took down Chicago State over the weekend. Uh, or over the midweek to finish off non-conference play. They're now 10-3. and three. I've got you listed as Drew. I'm just screwing everything up right now. Uh, here's the deal. Yeah, you don't want to be Drew right now. Drew is not with, not, not with us. He's still alive, but he's not on the, sh- the show. Uh, so K-State <laughs> takes down Chicago State. Now they get ready to start non or Big 12 play. And look, I the non-conference was up and down. And, and Fan has talked about this with us. Like, it makes – it's tough to make sense of because they have some legitimate wins against that Providence and Villanova teams, but they also have some really sloppy play and just inexcusable moments throughout the non-conference. And the overall numbers don't stack up and look very good right now. We can talk all we want about K-State versus UCF in this game this weekend, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But a lot of what needs to be discussed with K-State basketball, it's 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 about them. It's just about this individual team and how they'll go out and play. So what is the expectation for K-State this weekend as they open Big 12 play at home against UCF where, look, as, as much as the team has struggled a little bit, they're 10-3, and three, it's conference play. I would assume there's going to be a pretty good crowd in Bramlage on Saturday evening. 
what what do we think we get out of K-State? Because this is honestly, this is like opening night 2.0 for K-State basketball. There was a lot of excitement going into that USC game. I think you can get people to kind of gain all that momentum and energy and channel it back into this, but you're going to have to come out and play really well, I think, to start against UCF or you, you lose all that equity again and people are back to being down the dumps and uh, just as grim as the actual play looks on the court, I think the the fan and interaction and engagement will look the same way. Yeah. No. Now, as long as they remain a competitive bunch that's in the NCAA tournament conversation, I think Bramlage will probably be packed to the gills mm-hmm. uh, the rest of the season. Um, they, I mean, if there's one thing this fan base does, it is that they, even up to this point, even though it hasn't been pretty at times, they adore Jerome Tang, and they will come out for him um, in droves. So I think it will be a great crowd. What I would say is, in terms of expectations, I think that was the question, what you what you kind of expect. Inspired effort? Because I thought inspired effort was probably something that, was pro- that you could probably be the most critical of in terms of the consistency of that throughout the non-conference play. I think Kansas State – in general, played to the opponent, uh, the the name yeah. on the, the other jersey. Because, look, when they played Villanova and Providence, it's two of their best games of the year, and they won them. And, and honestly, like, for probably most, like, a lot, a good chunk of that Miami game, they, they did find a way. Like, they started out in a little exactly. bit of a struggle. But, I mean, you could look up and down and, I think you could make the case that that is probably one of the most complete games K-State played all season. And what's concerning about that is they played nowhere near a complete game in that. But like that, the way they played in that Miami game at points is more impressive to me than how they played against Chicago State or Wichita State or you know North, North Alabama. Alabama, Oral Roberts, whoever you want to name there. So I, I think yeah. there's there's some like there's some weird stuff with this team, and individually there are pieces. It just goes back to kind of what I've been, I think, worried about since the the beginning is I don't know that there's a true number one on this team. And I think that there is some shaken confidence in a lot of places. Like Tyler Perry's struggling right now to shoot the basketball. He needs to be shooting it more, though. He He's passing up shots from the outside. Like that three-point percentage and those numbers aren't going to get better if you're not actually taking the shots when they're there. I think he's got to be able to fire a little bit more. I just th- There are some other things with this team right now where – I think they're so lost for answers that you're just trying different things every other night. And when you just can't get any rhythm there, that makes it tough as well. Um, I mean, like Taj Manning hadn't played in however long. And then all of a sudden he's getting minutes and like, he's getting treated like he was the catalyst for winning that game against Chicago state, which who knows he may have been. Um, And and now I I have to seriously consider in my head, does, does Taj Manning need minutes uh, against UCF in a significant way? He might, because honestly, he showed more effort and like locked in nature in that game. And like that move he made at the end to finish with the dunk. Like I was like, that that's the most impressive move I've seen from a K-State basketball player in weeks now. So uh, this is such a weird team to figure out. And I, I've got so many emotions with with them right now that are just up and down and all over the place. Yeah, it's volatility, right? And I kind of said it is when we that would I think fired you up, and because it, it's true that they're playing to the name on the other team's jersey a little yeah. too much. But now you probably won't have that problem because you're playing Big Twelve game every every night. So maybe that'll liven this team up. We'll see. Um, I'm not completely out on them, but I do think. They might be in a dogfight to make the NCAA tournament. The Pro- Providence losing Bryce Hopkins does not help because that might not stay a quad one win anymore um, because, I mean, Providence yeah. is Bryce Hopkins. Uh, uh, but maybe it will. Who knows? But, I mean, like we said, some of their better performances are when they are playing teams with a flashy name on their chest. And that that makes you question a little bit what this team is made of when, when that's the case. Mm-hmm. But it's also le- looking forward. You don't have to worry about that anymore either. Yeah. Um, to some extent, because I, I will say, like, even though UCF is going to have the Big 12 logo on their chest, when you see UCF on the basketball court, and yeah. it's not necessarily going to make you go, oh, you know, like, get, I know, I get up I think, with these guys. But I think the Big 12 is the reputation it does that, you know, it's conference season. This is time to go. Yeah. That's the way I see it anyway. But there is – 
a few silver linings. Like offensively, this team is very, very challenged right now. And like you said, that they have two guys, Tyler Perry and Arthur Kaluma, who at least be look like their confidence is shaken enough to where they're they're confused on when to take a shot and when not to. Um, when that figures out, I think they're going to be good enough to make an NCAA tournament. They just got to figure it out in time. We'll see if they do. But the, the silver linings are, despite this team not being able to really put the ball in the bucket from the outside at any consistent rate, and, and though the effort seems to kind of come and go, they're getting to the free throw line. You got to make them a little bit more, but they are yeah. getting to the free throw line. They are offensive rebounding. I think they might be the best offensive rebounding team in the Big 12 right now, um, or at least one of them. So those are two big things um, that can kind of make up for woeful shooting performances. But if those two things also stay there when you and if you can increase your shooting percentages a little bit, then you're working with something. And, and I think something that we do overlook is in the last month, Kansas State's defense has gotten a lot better. Yeah. No, that's true. The, the, I think the defense is there. Um, it's just it's offensively has to come along. They, um, they've, they've risen up all the way to the top 40 in the country in defense. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's tough, too, because like this team is obviously worse off because you don't have Naquan Tomlin and Quez Glover like you would have thought. I just want people to like not go so far to one side of making excuses for this team or like giving them a pass. While Naquan Tomlin and Quez Glover would undoubtedly make this team better and it would avoid them from having such a short bench and other issues that are kind of coming up from this, a lot of the problems that K-State's having right now would probably still be happening with those guys on this team. And I think we'd still be talking about them like there are serious concerns here. And I, I this is a this is a stretch of games. You have 19 games coming up, 18 conference games and at least one guaranteed in Kansas City, where you are going to have to number one, see what Jerome Tang and his coaching staff is really made of because as tough of a job as they had last year and did a great job with it, like they were phenomenal coaches last year. But at some point, you can kind of put this thing on autopilot when you have two All-Americans and Marquise Noel and Keontae Johnson. Now, these the staff deserves credit for making those guys into that partway through the year, but eventually that's what they are, and their talent speaks for itself. You had a guy like Desi Sills that was highly motivated, and like, as, look, you know me, I was very much not a Desi guy for a good chunk of last season, but I came to appreciate him. He got smarter and better with his role last year. Like, you had so many guys on last year's team that knew what they needed to do. They knew how to be leaders, both in, hey, it's my time to take over this game, and also, how do I speak to my my team right here? And I think right now, like, it's there wasn't much coaching, I think, in terms of a lot of things that had to go on. I think now motivation-wise or, like, getting guys locked in last year, that's pro probably where a lot of it went down to. But, like, Jerome Tate's going to have to do some really – overhauling type work here I think to get this team playing in the right way and it may not even necessarily include personnel on the floor or whatever else it might just have to include mentality and finding a different way to get across these guys and like you're saying maybe it does end up just coming down to hey it's big 12 play you no longer are you playing these scrubs every other night and three quarter full gyms like it's going to be big time game after big time game coming up now but K-State's got to find a way to step it up here and I, I think it you're just dealing with a lot of guys right now that there's inconsistency. Uh, there's a lack of understanding of what to do or um, maybe even just confusion and, and how to handle when things are going poorly. And you're just going to have to rely on some guys and, and hope for the best. But I, this is, this is a scary and not so fun time for K state. Like if you're, you're trying to get a vibe check of me right now and Look, I'm a pretty pessimistic guy, but with, with K-State basketball, I typically actually tend to see uh, the the good more than anything. I don't feel very good about this team right now. And, and that's a total 180 from where I was after like the first three weeks of this season because when all the stuff right before the season started against USC went on, I was down on this team. I felt kind of how I do now. But then even against USC and how they played to start the season, I thought, you know what, actually, like, this team, they have something there. And they had me all the way bought back in after that LSU game. But it just has not looked the same since then. 
I don't know what it is. And I think you're just dealing with when you have a team that is essentially compiled like a house of cards in a lot of different ways. Number one, injury, one more injury could just crush this team. I mean, think about when Tyler Perry is rolling around on the floor in pain Tuesday night or Monday night, whenever that game was. And you're like, oh my gosh, like if you lose him, you have zero chance this year. That's one element to it. But then you're thinking about the way that these guys play. Like, can't I think volatility is the perfect word. K State is like you, you left some chicken out for an hour too long. And you're like, I don't know how this is going to come out. Like, I could eat this and it could still be really good chicken, or I could be dying in three hours because chicken is very volatile meat, as we know, uh, thanks to, to studies. Like, this team is the definition of volatile, where it can be up here, because I still think this K-State team, they can go toe-to-toe and beat anybody in the Big 12 any given night. They have the individual talent if it comes together. But it's too, there's too many warning signs that say it won't. So uh, that, that's a lot of words and a lot of scatterbrained thoughts, but like that's how just broken I am thinking about this K-State basketball team right now. They're, we're just not going to know or be able to find answers for them until they actually do it themselves on the floor. and. I just, I'm going to continue to have my doubts that they actually are able to do it. And that's not me doubting Jerome Tang. Like, I, I still think the world of Jerome Tang is a head coach and a lot of the other things, but I'm just worried that this team and this season might have too much going on where it's just a loss and, and it's going to unfortunately be uh, a down year after how awesome year one was and all the eggs have to go into next year's basket. And then you have to hope that you can actually be successful in transfer portal this off season when you weren't last year and you struggled. Well, I, you know, I shouldn't say they weren't successful last year, but you had a lot of major misses. Uh, and it's, it's obviously showing right now. Now, how are you going to be able to do stuff in the transfer portal coming off of a down year? And that would be the thing to where this year could set up longer-term issues moving forward for K-State. But long-term, like, I still have faith in Jerome Tang. Like, I, I think Jerome Tang is the is the guy, and I think he, he can get K-State to basketball heights that, you know, we have not seen at K-State in a long, long time. But if he's going to do it this year in any way, and that's just even getting this team qualified for the tournament, it's going to come down to guys like Tyler Perry getting right. It's going to come down to Arthur Kaluma getting it going. and. You're just going to have to hope that some other guys step up in ways that I'm not sure are possible or you wouldn't have expected. So I don't know. That's a lot. I'll let you I'll let you finish out on K-State here because we, we don't need to go any longer on me being a, a negative Nelly about the Wildcats because I know that's not what people want. There will be negative comments about it. I'm, I'm aware of that, and that's okay. Uh, I, I, I will say that I can't necessarily be positive Patty here um, because I have – um, some hesitation and some question marks about where this team ultimately goes as well and, and where it currently sits. But I do remember that they have had some high points. They need some consistency. They need to legitimately do this week in and week out or, or game in and game out, like what you did against Villanova, LSU, Providence, the tail end of the Miami game. Um, I, I'm still on out hope. I think there's enough talent and these coaches are good enough to where they can – scrimmage away nine or 10, 10 wins in the league. And, and then you're probably sitting in the tournament at, at that case, in my opinion. So, yeah, I don't know if it's a team that's necessarily going to be dangerous in the NCAA tournament. I mean, any team can be dangerous. This, uh, I'm not worried about this team being dangerous or winning games in the NCAA tournament right now. Just, just get, just there, get there, you know, I, I yeah. st- I'm still holding out hope that they can. The only thing I, uh, you know, one point I would have wrestled you with is when you talked about, Tomlin and Glover and how they, they didn't wouldn't really change things too much, uh, at least for anyone on the roster. I think Glover would have changed things for Tyler Perry because I think part of the the thing that we're, we're seeing with Perry and that he's going through, and maybe he'll come out on the other side just in time too and, and soon, is that he's got a lot of responsibility to also be the point guard right now because yeah, they, they Ames can't do it for 40 minutes. They aim to probably can't yeah. do it for 30 minutes. He's going through his own growing pains because he's just a true freshman. When Todd Perry's on the ball, having to create, having to do all these things, playing a little bit of a faster offense, um, I think that's messing with him a little bit in terms of his shooting ability. If he were able to play off the ball more, 
which he could if Quez Glover was available, I think you would see his shooting stroke be a lot better. Yeah, I you're right. And, uh, you know, you need a guy like Day-Day Ames to get better to where drum tank can feel like he can be on the floor. Because I, I think this is one of the things that Fan has has been good about it with, with showing his numbers, like with Day-Day on the floor, all this. The, the reason why K-State has been better with Day-Day Ames on the floor is not because of Day-Day Ames. And the reason why you don't have that lineup on the floor as often as you would maybe like is because Data Ames in the normal sense of like being a basketball coach has not been good enough for Jerome Tang to warrant to keep him on the floor, but it's a style thing. As we know, like Jerome Tang comes from Baylor where guard play is king and he wants to be able to have guards on the floor and do all this. And like you said, like if Day Day's out there, then Tyler Perry can be a little bit more off the ball, but I think a lot of what this is going to depend on is Day-Day Ames getting to a, a level to where he's good enough to where he can be left on the floor for extended periods of time to where that innate basketball coach sense in Jerome Tang is not like, get off the floor. You know, like you can't be out there right now. And that's a really tough thing to do for an 18, 19-year-old kid in the toughest basketball league in America. And I, I think that's, that's I mean, honestly, Day-Day Ames is probably the key to K-State's success the rest of the way. And I, I'm not even joking about that. Like, well, obviously, if Tyler Perry, Cam Carter, and Arthur Kaluma really get things going and they just explode to a new level, then Day-Day Ames does become slightly more irrelevant. But based on how things are going but right they, now, Day-Day they, Ames is the key to unlocking those guys because it's it's yeah. all about how the offense operates. I was going to say, if those guys explode, it's probably because Day-Day got better. Yeah. I, one thing here is just – and I, and I get that two of these games are on the road. But getting – and I know some of these teams are getting better too. But these are doable. Getting yes, to start are. getting to start Big 12 with UCF, West Virginia, and Tech is not a bad start. And, you know, you'll come home and face Baylor, but then you're also at home against Oklahoma State immediately after that. So, yeah. like, K-State, I I think if, you, if you're looking for a positive sign, K-State at the at, – at, the very least to be positive needs to be three and two after the first five games of big 12 play. And I could even listen if it's two and three, um, but think, anything I, less than that puts you in a really, really bad spot. I think you got to be three and two because then the next three games are against Iowa state, Houston and Oklahoma. That, the Oklahoma games at home. I think they're frauds. I think Iowa State is somewhat fraudulent. Oh, that, I mean, congrats to, congrats to Tiny School TJ and playing all those plus 300 non uh, Ken Palm teams in the non con. It's still but, it helps in, and those three yeah. teams are still, in my opinion, better than West Virginia Tech and UCF. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be really interested in the West Virginia game next week because, look, West Virginia is a totally different team right now with all their pieces being able to play. So I'll be fascinated to see how that ends up working out. As for UCF this weekend, look, I already said it earlier, this game for K-State is so much less about what UCF is. It's going to be all about how K-State plays and how they handle themselves. Uh, I, I'm with you. Look, I, I looked at UCF in the offseason. I thought, you know, this team might be better than I anticipated. Regardless of that, that is not a game that K-State should lose at home, no matter how good they are this year. It's not something that should happen. and K-State has to go out and win that game and take care of business with UCF. Um, so I, I, it, it may not be pretty again. I think K-State does probably win this game, though. Uh, I'll, I'll take the Cats this weekend probably by, like, five points. We're going to be sweating it out. People will be cussing up a storm in their group chats and going and melting down on on the message boards. K-State will win, and then you'll have some that are like, hey, but it's a win, 1-0, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't want to hear it, you know, save all the positivity for when good things start happening. But this could be the step in the right direction towards good things happening this weekend against UCF. Uh, and I, you know, I'm just going to bank and hope that at some point Tyler Perry busts out and has a big game. So I would pick Tyler Perry for my MVP on Saturday against UCF. I, I, I'll i take like Kansas State's win, at like a 68-69, not that score. Kansas State scores 68 yeah. or 69. Yeah. UCF gets 61, so like a seven, eight-point win. Uh, it's probably a tight game, like a three- or four-point game, or maybe less than that, but then becomes like the Tyler Perry free-throw show to win. Yeah. 
All right. Well, we'll see how it ends up going on and, and where things go. But that will do it for this edition of the KSO Show. A uh, lot to get to in today's episode. We talked about Matt Wells coming on staff as the new quarterbacks coach and co-OC with Connor Riley. Also some transfer portal stuff and then ending it there with basketball. We will be back. We'll have coverage all day Saturday for the Wildcats and the Knights. That will be a big time game for K-State as they try to get the season back on the rails. Positivity moving in the right direction as they start Big 12 play for basketball. So stay locked into everything with K-State. Over on kstateonline.com, head to On3 to get set up for that. Also, make sure you're still checking out the YouTube page right here. Get subscribed if you're not. That way you immediately know when videos are up. Uh, we, While we were recording this, posted the instant reaction to Matt Wells being hired. Uh, and then you can also follow all three of us there on Twitter, as you see, or X, depending on how you call it. Elon can try all he wants. I will forever call it Twitter. It will always be Twitter to me. Unless it stops acting like Twitter, then I may have to call it X. I don't know. So that will do it for us. Thank you for watching the KSO show. That's Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. We'll be back. I'll have stuff for you Saturday after the basketball game on here, and then we'll have a, a full week next week because there will be a lot more to talk about, digest with football, I'm sure, and then also basketball with a full week uh, in the first road trip of Big 12 play to Morgantown. So we are out of here. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State